If you were stuck in the woods and your friends became infected by a horrific virus that destroys your flesh, what would you do? No one is coming to help, so I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the flesh-eating disease in Cabin Fever 2016. This group of college kids are going to regret leaving home. The friends are taking a trip to a lakeside cabin in the middle of nowhere, where they notice this kid in a buddy mask sitting quietly. Paul here walks towards him, holding out his hand to say hi, when suddenly, the kid viciously bites into his hand, and the college student screams in pain. The kid's father walks out, scolding the boy for making a stupid mistake. Paul insists it's not his fault, but the man doesn't care, and tells the kid to go play by himself. The father then suggests Paul wash his hands using a hose, and just as the guy walks away, Jeff here could confronts the father and letting this kid sit in front, knowing that he could be a danger to other people. The man moves closer to him, questioning his intentions. Jeff lets him know that this incident could result in a lawsuit, meaning the father could get himself into deep trouble. His friend decides to take the man away, while Jeff's girlfriend scolds him for the terrible situation they've gotten themselves into. In the backyard, Paul here washes out his wound, and as bad as this seems, he's got no idea all five friends are going to die horrific deaths. Inside the gas station, the group takes a look at these jars filled with yellow liquid. The father's friend takes the jar away, warning Marcy that these contain fox urine that will make every kind of animal want to mate with him. Bird here tells the others that he's going to grab some beer, while the father's friend asks them what they're doing out here in the sticks. Jeff reveals that they're on vacation, and the man creepily wishes them a good time before Paul comes back holding onto his wound. The man then warns that they should be careful, especially when hiking in the woods, adding that Lyme disease is common around here, and they should be checking for ticks. A few hikers got sick the week before, and he ominously tells them that doctors took care of them. Confused, Jeff insists that he explain further, but that's when Bert here is confronted by the father for stealing a Snickers bar. He apologizes for the inconvenience and hands over the candy. The father demands that he leave along with the others, watching closely with his friend as they drive off. It's clear the locals don't like the students, and soon they'll be hunting them down. The group make their way further out to the countryside, while Karen here wraps up the bitten guy's hand, until they arrive at their destination, a lakeside cabin. Checking out the insides, Jeff reads a message out loud that states, if you're looking for fun, you've come to the wrong place. The group ignores his warning message, now realizing this is going to result in the most terrifying week of their lives. Okay, these people are super weird, and hanging out in a Lyme disease-infected woods anywhere near them is not my idea of a good vacation. But there's not a whole lot that's happened yet to hint at the horrifying events that are about to transpire. That being said, who wants to spend time at a vacation home in the woods infested by ticks that could lead to a life-altering disease? Now, Lyme disease is usually not fatal, and in most cases can be easily treated with antibiotics. But in some cases, when Lyme disease isn't caught and treated early, it can lead to chronic late-stage Lyme, which can cause damage to your joints, nerves, and brain. Jeff here never says how he booked this vacation, but there's no way the disease ticks were included in the brochure. If it were me, I would try to find out how Jeff booked this cabin and whether or not we can get our money back. Hearing that hikers got sick and needed to be treated only a week before is enough reason for any vacation rental company to give us our money back. Vacation home rental websites such as Airbnb usually have refund policies that allow you to cancel if you arrive at the rental unit and it's uninhabitable or is a hazard to your health or safety. Since a major draw of staying at this cabin is being in the woods, the vacation is already ruined if we're worried about ticks. Getting out before something other than Dennis bites me is the safest bet in this situation. The other thing that I would have to keep in mind is that it's definitely possible nobody else here wants to leave because of the ticks, and we only have one car between the five of us. The other members of the group might think I'm being dramatic, and I'll have to make my argument for why we should leave. Instead of just accepting the risk that comes with staying for the weekend, I would drive back down to town where I have self-service and use my phone to research what happened to the hikers that needed to be treated. If there's no article or information online, I would reach out to the local hospital and sheriff's department to see if they can provide me with anything. In the worst case scenario, the father's friend knew about the hikers, so even though I never really want to see the dad or his weird kid again, as a last resort, I would also go back and ask how they learned about the hikers. If I can get their names, I can Google them to see if I'm able to get information on what happened or contact their friends and family to find out the severity of their diagnosis. This would then give me enough information to come back to my friends and convince them to get the f out of this cabin and spend time lying on a beach somewhere in the Caribbean away from these crazy people. Bird here walks in complimenting the house, but mentioning that there's no TV to Jeff. Karen tells him that she can't even find a signal on her phone, meaning that there's probably no internet here either. Bird questions how they're going to last a week without TV, internet, or weed. Jeff insists they don't need anything to have a good time, and goes upstairs to make love with his girlfriend. Later, Bird here walks out to the lake with an assault rifle to Paul's surprise, and the college student explains that he wants to improve his survival skills with all this open space around them. 
Paul insists that it's a bad idea, knowing that he might end up shooting someone, and tells his friend to be careful. Suddenly, Bert accidentally fires off shots in his direction, and he instantly apologizes, while Paul here walks off, ordering him to keep the weapon out of his sight. The man finds his crush Karen taking photos on her phone, and questions how she's managing to get a signal now. Karen tells him that she can still upload posts slowly, but Paul insists that she put the phone down and enjoy nature. He then asks the girl how long they've known each other, and Karen answers they've been friends since fourth grade. She asks Paul if he's going to swim while seductively taking her clothes off, challenging the man to a race. Meanwhile, Bert here is moving through the woods, playing around with his gun, when suddenly, he accidentally shoots this disfigured man who limps over and screams at him. The stranger's skin is rotting, and it's clear something is wrong with the man. Terrified, Bert insists that he stay back, but the man won't listen, forcing him to fire a warning shot to keep the guy away. The stranger begs him to call for help, but Bert runs off as he screams for him to come back. The college student returns to the cabin before Jeff and his girlfriend confront him about the fire he lit earlier, but didn't bother putting out. Marcy scolds him for constantly messing up and bringing in an assault rifle to their vacation. Frustrated, they ask what he was doing, and the college student lies, saying that he was hunting squirrels, with no idea he's made the biggest mistake of his life. That night, the group hangs out around the campfire, and Jeff asks that Paul tell his personal story, but the guy is reluctant to say anything because it was so traumatic. The others urge him to let it all out, and Bert demands that he say it. Giving in, Paul explains that he used to go to an old bowling alley in their town every weekend with his dad, but then something terrible happened. One day, his father told him that the place was closed because an employee was holding his co-workers hostage at gunpoint, tying each of them to a chair and arranging them in a circle so that they were facing each other. The employees were gagged and beaten before they were brutally killed one by one. The psychotic employee ended up by taking out the fire racks and brutally hacked off all of their limbs. When the police arrived, they only found the employee's torsos with no sign of the killer since. Bird calls his bluff and the group cracks up, assuming that the story was fake. Paul insists that he's telling the truth when suddenly he turns around to see this hiker Grimm standing behind him, shocked. Bird questions where the man came from, and he explains that he saw their campfire, deciding to come say hello while on his midnight hike. Grimm sits down, and the group questions what he's doing around here. The man tells them that he's taking a nature with his dog, and mentions that this area is home to some of the best free climbing spots. The stranger then asks them if it's alright if he sticks around, but Jeff informs them that they're having a private conversation. The hiker understands where the group is coming from, but that's when he brings out a large bag of weed, and tells them that he'll have to smoke it by himself. It's a compelling reason to keep him around, and they insist he stay, with no idea that their time at this cabin is going to turn into a bloodbath. Okay, these college students are all trying to relax and have a good time, but they completely miss the fact that Bert here is acting weird as hell when he comes back from the woods. He's hiding his encounter with the disfigured man, and if Jeff and Marcy were paying more attention, they could press him for information to find out about the diseased man in the woods earlier. It's completely crazy that Bert never says anything to them about the man, and even though he accidentally shot the guy, it doesn't make any sense that he didn't say something. The man's skin is being completely torn apart by a flesh-eating bacteria, and if it were me, I would drive into town immediately to get a medical attention. Regardless of the fact that Bert should want to help this poor dying man, he's completely stupid to think leaving this guy here isn't going to come back to bite him later. The man is in desperate need of medical attention, and he's closest to the college student's cabin, which means he's bound to come there later if nobody comes back to help him. The man also never threatens Bert, and the student shot him an accident, so unless Bert's gun is illegal, and the woods are a no hunting zone, he has no reason to hide the diseased man. Bert is being completely stupid here, and if it were me, the simple task of getting this man help could make everyone here realize that we all need to get out of here as fast as we can. It's not every day that a man with a flesh-eating bacteria crosses your path, but if it were me, that would be the end of my vacation right there and then. Jeff and Marcy also could have pressed Bert for more information. When Bert comes back from the woods, he's quiet and disoriented, and tries to end their conversation quickly. They toss his behavior up to video game withdrawals, but he's just come out of the woods after going out to shoot squirrels with a rifle, so before I let him go, I want to make sure that the worst hasn't happened. Since Bert is evasive, he probably isn't going to tell a story about the diseased man, which is why I would go to the woods to see what else he can find out there that he's not telling me. Now, at this point, if I were Jeff and Marcy, I still really wouldn't want to go into the woods and run into one of the ticks the people in town mentioned. But in order to make sure my bozo friend hasn't killed anyone, I would try to find as much deed as possible and spray it on myself to find out what exactly is going on. The other thing here that the group of college students is forgetting to do is ask Grimm for any information on the hikers that needed to be hospitalized. Grimm is a weird dude just like the town where the college students are smoking his weed, so asking him some questions to figure out how safe the woods shouldn't be a problem. He claims to be a free climber, and should know more about the surrounding area than them. The group decide to let him stay, and he explains that Grimm is a nickname he was given while lighting up a joint. The man reveals that he came from Berkeley, and Karen tells him that she was just there, meeting some partygoers who drank nothing but beer for five days straight. 
Bert comments that it doesn't sound too bad, and Jeff challenges him to do the same. The boys shake hands, but that's when Grimm notices that rain is coming their way. Jeff invites him to come inside and hang out, but he lets the group know that he's got some expensive gear outside of his camping tent that will be destroyed in the rain. Grimm tells him that his spot is only 20 minutes away, and Karen here insists that he bring the weed if the hiker comes back. Grimm assures her that the weed will be on him, leaving with his dog. Later, they sit around the living room sharing awkward sex stories. They hear a knock on the door, and Jeff here gets up, thinking it's the hiker. Suddenly, a bloodied man appears in front of them, begging for help. The group offers to give him medical assistance, but that's when he spots Bert and remembers what he did earlier in the day. The college student rushes to close the door, demanding the others not let a contagious person inside. Panicking, Marcy insists they call for help, but realizes they don't have any reception. Bert spots the man taking their car, grabbing his gun, and the group runs outside while Jeff bangs on the locked car window. Suddenly, the stranger coughs blood onto the window, and Paul here swings his baseball bat at the man as he tries to leave the vehicle. Bert fires shots upwards, demanding that he stay back as the man inches closer to them. Marcy sprays gasoline onto the disfigured man, causing him to lift his shirt up, revealing his rotting flesh, and he screams in pain. That's when the trail of gasoline is lit, covering the man in fire as he runs into the forest. This group of college kids have made a terrible mistake, and they're going to find out that this isn't over just yet. Okay, these college kids have just lit a diseased man on fire instead of helping him, and now they'll have to pay for the consequences one way or another. At the end of the day, Bert here is the one to blame, because if he had just mentioned that there was a sick man in the woods earlier, the diseased man wouldn't have freaked out and tried to steal their car. Sure, the college kids acted in self-defense, but if they had found a way to calm him down and taken their car to get help, they wouldn't have lit this man up like a tiki torch, and their car wouldn't look like this. Rather than go to sleep, I would first try to see if the man is still alive. The college kids all just assume that he's dead and don't go out looking for him. He could have survived the fire and now is lying somewhere suffering while they sleep. If I'm not able to find him, I would then walk back to town or until I have cell service so I can contact someone to let them know what happened. The college kids are right that they can use the self-defense argument here, but there was a possibility that the situation could have been de-escalated, and the longer they wait to report the crime, the worse it looks for them. Even though I don't know the exact distance to town, when the college kids drove up to the cabin earlier, they arrived at the corner store when the sun was already up and arrived with enough daylight to still have a full day of activities. If the drive time is a half an hour going 20 miles per hour, then it should take me about two and a half hours walking at a quick pace of four miles per hour. And the best case scenario, I can hitchhike or I'll get phone service before I even get there. The car is a completely lost cause because even if we fix it, that means we would have to clean it and we don't know what the diseased man was sick with. By the looks of it, he may have had a flesh-eating disease commonly referred to as necrotizing fasciitis. Although flesh-eating disease isn't highly contagious when it comes to skin-to-skin -skin contact, the disease can be spread by getting into the body from a cut or wound. The diseased man has also vomited up blood, which is a completely new fun added bonus to his condition, meaning that what he had could be even worse, and staying away from it altogether is the safest bet. With all things considered, Paul here needs to keep that child bite wrapped as tight as possible. The other thing that the college students could do is try to find Grimm's tent. The man mentions that he's only a 20 minute distance from them, and if they start walking in the direction he went, they might be able to see a path to his tent. No matter what though, I'm not staying anywhere near the puddles of blood the man regurgitated in case he can pass the bacteria onto me. Later that night, Jeff justifies her actions by stating that it was self-defense, mentioning the man could have survived because it was raining. Bird questions what happened to him, noticing that a looks like something was eating away at the man's skin. Karen here insists they contact the police now, telling them that it wasn't their fault. Bird informs her that there isn't any signal, and since he's not going to drive the car full of blood, they can only wait until tomorrow morning to take action. The next day, the boys decide what to do about their situation. They end up arguing over who messed up worse, when Marcy walks out and scolds them for not doing anything, walking off to look for help, jumping into their kayak, and sailing down the river. Paul heads upstairs to give Karen here some water while she packs her bags, telling him that she just wants to go home. The guy insists that it wasn't their fault and tries to comfort her by saying that the sick stranger was going to die either way. Comforting his friend, Paul sits down with her heading over the glass of water to make sure that she's okay. Meanwhile, the other boys walk through the forest and find this abandoned looking house in the distance. Bert is too scared to check it out, and that's when they hear a screeching sound from inside this barn. Walking inside, the boys find this old woman skinning a pig, furious. She shows them the animal's insides and tells them that it's the third sick cat of the month. They decide to change the top, asking her if she knows any mechanics in the area. The lady tells them they need to go into town, mentioning that she can't take them since she's already been there. Jeff politely asks her to let them know if she's going again, and explains they're staying in a cabin a few miles away. The lady apologizes for not realizing the severity of their situation and invites them to her house, mentioning that there's a radio they can use inside to call her friend. 
later, Bert thanks her, telling the lady that there was a crazy man who tried to break into their car the night before. She offers them drinks, asking to elaborate further on what happened, and Jeff explains it was a crazy forest tournament they had to scare off with bats. That's when she mentions that it could have been her cousin Henry. She questions that they attacked him, but the boys quickly make up a lie that it was their friend and walk out of her house, realizing that they just killed this lady's cousin. Okay. This woman here gutting the pig has been no help at all. Not only is she freaky as hell, but she's the cousin of the man that the college kids just lit on fire. Jeff and Bert decide to get out of their stats, but before making a run for it, they should try to get as much information about the disease that killed the woman's pig as they possibly can. Now, Bert and Jeff here find out a little too late that the creepy woman is the cousin of the diseased man, so they've already told her too much about what happened with her cousin. But if the boys take a look at the photo and double down the fact that the man is not the same man from the night before, there are a couple things that they can do. This woman here, as creepy as she is, is a farmer and has more information than these college students on wildlife and what may have killed her pig. The woman is covered in the pig's blood and doesn't seem to be worried about catching whatever the pig had from skin-to-skin -skin contact, which means that whatever is causing the infection could be harming its carrier from the inside. Henry and the woman's pig could have eaten, drank, or breathed in something that started the infection instead of touching someone or something that was infected. By talking more to this woman, they can get her more educated opinion on why she isn't scared of catching what the pig had. This could help in protecting us later by figuring out that there's another way of catching the disease and we can clean the car without having to worry about touching the blood and guts. The other thing that the boys can do is ask the woman more about the location of Henry's campsite. The photo itself doesn't reveal much about the man's location, but it definitely confirms that Henry is the one they killed. I would ask the woman to tell us where exactly the campsite in the photo is so I can go and talk to Henry myself to see if he might know anything about the hermit that we hit. Of course, we know that Henry is dead, but this would be a good way to get away from the woman and also let us know where he lived so we can go to his campsite to look for clues for what caused the illness. The last and final thing that the college kids need to do is use the woman's phone because if they go any longer without telling the police what happened, their self-defense story will look less and less plausible, especially in a small town full of people that don't like city folk. Marcy makes her way down the river, tying her kayak to the dock, and is shocked by the other boys. They mention that nobody was at the house, telling her that the police must have no idea what happened yet. Meanwhile, Paul here walks outside of the cabin to see this cop, and approaches her when she suddenly turns around, pointing her gun at him. The woman introduces herself as Deputy Winston, and asks him to explain what happened last night. He tells the deputy that a sickly man came by, causing a scene, but they couldn't call for help without any signal. She mentions that most people in this area use radios, and comments that they must have had a party the night before. Scared, he tells tells the deputy that they were drinking, and repeats his story to her, but she tells him to stop talking, reassuring him that the report has already been written down. She pulls her sunglasses down and weeks, revealing a scar on her upper cheek. That's when Karen walks out, and the sheriff orders her to go back inside, commenting to the man that his friend is extremely good looking. She encourages him to stay and party, informing the college kid that she will call a tow truck by tomorrow afternoon, as long as they can party together. Paul awkwardly agrees, and Deputy Winston tells him to take care before driving off. Later that day, the boys begin washing the blood off their car. Bird here gags from being inside the vehicle, asking Paul if the sheriff is going to come back. He admits that the woman wasn't trustworthy, but assumes that they're not in trouble for the incident, and mentions that Karen wants to get the hell out of here. Bert teases him, telling him that this is going to ruin his big plan to become her boyfriend. Suddenly, Paul insists that he stay still, looking behind him to see Grimm's vicious dog staring at them, and it's furious. Bert tries to calm it down, slowly walking away while telling his friend not to hit the dog or else it'll attack. That's when Marcy fires off a few shots in the animal's direction and manages to scare it off. The boys are surprised by her shooting skills, and Marcy asks if they know what the hell is going on, finding it strange that it wasn't with its owner. Inside the cabin, the group reunite, and Jeff tells them that the man from last night is dead, but there's something in the woods that infected him, and the stranger has spread it around. He insists they can't wait around anymore and need to go right now on their own. The others suggest they inform someone of the incident before leaving, and Jeff reluctantly agrees to their idea. But Paul interrupts to say that the deputy will start out the incident as the only outsiders here. Feeling sick, Karen leaves the table to return to her room, and the man follows her back to her bed, asking if she wants any food. That's when the girl grabs his hand, insisting that he stay with her for a while. Outside, Jeff keeps watch with the rifle as Bert here fixes up their car. Suddenly, the vicious dog reappears, and the man tries to scare it off, but the animal won't back away, no matter how many times he fires the gun. Meanwhile, Paul wakes up next to his crush, and they decide to spend more time together. But then Karen complains it hurts, and he realizes that there's blood coming from under the bed sheets. Shocked, Karen realizes that her legs are covered with lesions and rotting away while Paul rushes outside to tell the others. They head into her room, and as soon as Bert sees the damage, he insists they all need to leave, terrified that she's contagious. The infected girl screams out in pain, begging Paul not to go, but the college student pushes him away. Outside the room, Bert tells her to stay in bed until they can find help. Now one of their own is infected, and they have no idea what's going on. 
Okay, what the heck is wrong with the people in this town? The college kids have gotten lucky, and Deputy Winston here doesn't seem at all concerned about what happened with the diseased man they just killed, even though their car is covered in blood and looks like this. She only cares about whether or not the college students like the party, and stops Paul when he tries to explain what happened. She doesn't call for backup, or even look for the diseased guy, or ask the college kids to come down to the station to file an official statement on the incident. This behavior is so weird and suspicious that it kind of makes you question whether or not the whole town is in on some sort of conspiracy to poison and kill outsiders. However, Deputy Winston doesn't do anything to threaten the college students, but instead just lets them go. If it were me, I would get out of town as soon as the car is running. Not only is this a town with a flesh-eating disease going around, but it doesn't look like the police are going to be any help if anything happens to us either. Jeff here is a complete douchebag, but he has a point about leaving. Grimm's dog has just shown up sick with no sign of Grimm, and we could be next on the mysterious diseases list. Rather than stay, I would wrap Karen up in a plastic bag and throw her in the front seat of the car and hightail it out of there. The only way to get rid of flesh-eating bacteria is with antibiotics or cutting the infected skin, so she needs immediate medical attention. The interesting thing about Karen being sick is that she didn't touch the diseased man or Grimm's dog, so the fact that she has the flesh-eating disease reconfirms our pig lady theory from earlier that the sickness isn't caught from skin-to-skin -skin contact, but is instead ingested. To rule out different substances, I would have Karen write down everything she ate and drank in the last 24 hours and try to isolate what's carrying the sickness based on what the healthy people ate and drank. Since this also means that the food, air, or water could be contaminated, our health is in danger by staying here, and the college students need to leave immediately. Even though Karen here is worried about getting in more trouble once the diseased man's body's later found, if they go to the police outside of this county and tell them they had to get out for their own safety, then they should be fine, especially if research is done later and there's evidence of the flesh-eating disease all over the woods. Grimm's disappearance and Karen's illness are more signs of danger, and they have enough evidence that they should not consume anything else in this town. Putting Karen in the car shouldn't be an issue either, since the disease isn't transferred through skin-to-skin -skin contact, and getting her to a doctor could save her life. As they fix the car and transfer Karen, they should give Marcy the gun since she's the best shot, so she can make sure this dog doesn't take a bite out of any of them in the meantime. That night, Marcy checks her friends to make sure they haven't been infected, wondering what to do with Karen, when suddenly the blonde girl appears and tells them to quarantine her away from the cabin. The group takes her into this tool shed where they've set up a mattress for the girl, and Paul insists that someone will be keeping watch before they close the door on her. He informs the others that he'll go look for help, but Marcy questions where he can go if there's no one for miles, pointing out that the vicious dog is still around. With his crush's life in danger, Paul decides to take his chances, and his friend throws him a flashlight before he goes running off. He makes his way through the forest when suddenly, Paul hears a terrifying growl and realizes the dog is somewhere nearby. Pointing the light around, he screams at it to come out and face him, but it's nowhere to be seen. The guy continues to the woods until he finds this van and looks inside, but that's when a woman with a shotgun appears, threatening Paul if he doesn't leave now. The college kid tries explaining his situation, but her husband comes out half naked and the guy runs away before they kill him. Back in the cabin, the group reunites with no idea of what to do next. Paranoid, Jeff tells them that anyone could have it and insists they all sleep separately. He gets into an argument with his girlfriend as he makes it clear he doesn't trust them. Seeing Bert hold this flaming marshmallow, he freaks out, but that's when Paul interrupts and screams at them for their constant arguing. The man calms down, telling the group that they need to work together or else they're screwed, but under the condition that they eat and sleep alone to avoid infection. The group agrees with his plan, but suddenly he spots the vicious dog outside, realizing that it's trying to break down the door to the shed. The guy tells Bert that he needs to shoot it, but they look away for a second before noticing that the dog has disappeared. Slowly walking outside, the group looks around for any sign of the animal. Bert knocks on the girl's door to inform her that the dog has disappeared, but there's no answer. The next morning, the group checks on their friend and finds the girl's infection has spread further through her body, leaving a disgusting stench. It's horrifying, and there's not much they can do to help. Meanwhile, Bert here manages to get the car running, but as his friends hold up Karen to take her to the vehicle, Bert here coughs out black blood and realizes that his arm is showing signs of infection. Somehow he got the disease and demands they head inside the vehicle now, but that's when Karen here coughs out a spray of blood herself. It's a terrifying situation, and only getting worse by the minute. Okay, it makes absolutely no sense that they isolate Karen in the shed. Paul here kissed her and was literally about to get a lot more physical, but there are no signs of lesions or sores on his body. If the sickness was transferable from person-to-person -person contact, then Paul would already be screwed and would be showing signs of decomposition. However, if the college students really want to see the source of the disease, they could isolate Paul and see if anything happens to him as well. Since he kissed Karen, he technically swapped saliva with her, and it's possible that the disease was transferred over to him by ingesting her spit. If Paul gets sick, then we know that the sickness is transferred via ingestion. Also, moving Karen to the shed outside only furthers their exposure if they really are 
are concerned about being contaminated. If she's locked behind a door and the college students seal off the door with rags and cloths, then it will minimize the risk of catching the illness if it is airborne. Paul and his friends have also still not gotten the car working, but when Paul runs away from the dog, he finds a couple in a trailer in the woods within running distance of them. Although the couple are unwilling to help him, Paul should bring back his friends and overpower the couple to get a hold of their phone. This is a life or death situation, and if these people can't see that these kids are in desperate need of help, then they deserve to stand out in the cold in their underwear while the students make contact with anyone outside of the county that can help them. At this point, I wouldn't call the police, because if I do, it will only put me in touch with Deputy Winston, who wasn't any help at all before. In this situation, I would call whichever one of the student's family members that was closest to the cabin and have them contact law enforcement in their area. By getting an official record of what's happening to me and my friends outside of this small woods town, I can't be blamed for anything that's happened later, and either backup will be sent to get us out of there before morning, or it will put pressure on the local law enforcement to come and get us. In an absolutely worst case scenario, the family member I can call can come and get us before morning. The other thing that the students are neglecting to address is Grimm's dog. Although it's sad, the college students need to kill Grimm's dog. It's rabid and infected, and is likely slowing down Bert from fixing the car, since he can't go outside without worrying about coming face to face with it. Noticing how sick Bert is, Jeff questions if the man is alright to drive, but he insists they get in before Karen's situation gets worse. It's clear he's avoiding the question, and Jeff demands to know if he touched the infected stranger, but suddenly Bert drives off alone to find help. With the situation getting out of hand, Jeff goes back into the house and walks out with two cases of beer. His girlfriend asks what he's doing, and the man blames the others for what's going on, insisting he's quarantining himself for his own protection. Paul heads back inside to take out the infected bed sheets and throws the bag of contaminated laundry into the lake. Later Later that day, Marcy begins to lose hope with her current situation as the last two in the house. She admits that there's no point in doing anything right now, confessing that she wants to make love with Paul before they all die. Meanwhile, Bert here returns to the gas station and asks the father for help, explaining that his friend is fatally sick. The man tells the college student to stay right where he is, noticing how sick he looks, and reluctantly agrees to call a doctor. He heads into the gas station to make a call, but that's when his son takes off his mask and rushes towards Bert. The kid bites into his hand as he screams in pain. The father rushes out, cursing Bert for causing all this trouble, telling him that he's already lost one child and he doesn't want to lose another. That's when Bert here begins violently coughing in front of him and spits out a mouthful of blood. Shocked, the father tells him they're going to solve this problem right now, whether he likes it or not. His friend then comes out with a shotgun and Bert panics, getting back into the car and driving off. His other friend stops the father from shooting and tells them they're going to put down every single college student to make sure nobody else will get the disease. Meanwhile, Paul walks into Karen's shed, bringing her water as the infection continues to get worse. He walks upstairs in the cabin to check on Marcy and finds that she's showing signs of infection too. Determined to survive, he tells the girl that he's going to find Jeff so they can leave now and get help. In the bathroom, she realizes that her wounds are getting worse and this wasn't from Paul's intense lovemaking. On the road, Bert is racing back to the cabin as he's chased down by the father and his crew. They shoot at his car and shatter the back window, while Bert manages to get further ahead, but then his engine dies. With no other options, he gets out of the vehicle and runs into the forest. Meanwhile, Paul here shouts out for Jeff to come out of hiding, but there's no sign of him anywhere. Suddenly, the disfigured man pops out of the lake and throws him down, trying to drown the kid while coughing blood into his face. Paul manages to hold him down in the water until the stranger dies and makes his way back to shore. Gasping for air, he notices a sign pointing to Willard Reservoir and that's when he realizes that the infection is coming from the water. In the forest, Bert continues to be chased on foot by the furious locals, realizing that his infection is rapidly getting worse and the skin is coming off of his arm. He leaves it on the tree and desperately runs away as the men find his piece of skin hanging giving them all the information they need to track him down. At the cabin, Marcy comes out of the house covered in blood and collapses to the ground, but that's when she realizes the vicious dog has found her. With no hope of survival, she screams at the dog and there's nothing she can do to save herself. That makes one victim down with four more to go. Later, Paul returns to find what's left for her body, gruesomely torn to shreds, and practically melted apart. That's when he hears Karen scream for her life, and after grabbing the rifle from inside the cabin, he rushes towards the shed. Opening the door, he finds the dog eating the woman and shoots it dead, saving Keeping his friend's life. Karen begs for the man to kill her and he tries to shoot her, but the gun doesn't fire. It must be empty, and with no better ideas, he decides to dump the gasoline around the shed. The man then pops a flare and tosses it on the floor, burning Karen to death. Now he's all alone, and there's no sign of his friends to save him, making that two victims down with three more to go.
Okay, this is extremely bleak. Karen, Marcy, and Paul are all falling apart at such a rapid pace that it's hard to keep up with who is dying fastest. Once the virus is in a person's body, there's no way for them to get rid of it unless they have antibiotics, and getting out quickly in the car isn't even an option anymore. However, there's something gruesome that Paul could have done in order to save himself. Paul here realizes a little too late for his friends the flesh-eating disease of being transferred in the water. It doesn't seem like he has been contaminated by the water yet, and unless he took a big gulp of it while he was in the lake, the place that the virus has entered his body is through the child bite on his hand. Instead of letting the virus spread throughout his body, he could sever the virus using a shovel or axe from the shed. This is a horrible situation, and the solution isn't for this faint of heart, but it's a common practice when a limb is no longer salvageable, or there's a risk that disease will spread from it into the rest of the body. If Paul severs the disease before it's able to spread through his bloodstream, he may be able to save himself from the other college student's fate. He'll then have to wrap it with cloth to stop the bleeding, but this will also require immediate medical attention. Without it, he will continue to lose blood, and his efforts will be in vain. Marcy here also could have survived for longer if she hadn't decided to shave her legs. It doesn't make sense that she did this now, and she already knows that she has caught the virus after she notices the bruises on her back. Rather than trying to take a nice soothing bath to calm herself down, Paul and Marcy should strategize how they're going to flag down help. Since this is their last ditch effort and they're both dying, I would set the house on fire. Marcy and Paul already know that they have kerosene and can start a fire easily. If the house is set ablaze, then others will see it and call for backup. When the National Forest Service comes to extinguish the flame, they will see what kind of shape we are in and have us helicoptered out of there. If they all survive, next time when they have a break from school, they should listen to Marcy and go to Belize instead of a creepy backwoods rental. Paul finds Bird outside, looking completely worn out from the infection, trying to tell him that the disgruntled father and his crew are coming. Suddenly, Bird is shot dead right in front of him, and that makes three victims down with two more to go. The survivor turns around to see the locals cheering each other for the great shot. Acting quickly, Paul picks up his rifle, but quickly remembers he can't fire the gun, until the father's friend informs him that the safety is still on. Switching it off, he thanks them for the advice and shoots the three men down. With all these people dead, Paul heads down the road to find the cars and gets into the father's truck. He drives it out of the forest, but realizes that his wounded hand has been infected. The man freaks out and crashes the vehicle into a nearby tree. Exhausted, he stumbles out of the truck covered in blood, running away from the vehicle as it explodes. Later, he finds the deputy and her friends relax around this campfire and confronts her on the tow truck that was meant to come by. The deputy tells him to calm down, explaining that the mechanic had an issue and needed a tow truck of his own. Furious, Paul asks the woman for a ride into town, but that's when the sheriff calls in, informing her that there are some college kids on a killing spree near the cabin. Hearing this, the deputy and her friends take out their weapons, as the sheriff mentions that they've all got a horrific skin-eating disease that will affect anyone who comes in contact before ordering her to shoot on sight. The deputy demands Paul to stay back, causing him to lash out and lunge forward, and one of the woman's friends swings his guitar, accidentally hitting his buddy in the process. Paul decides to make a deal with the deputy, insisting she goes to the cabin so the woman has an alibi for where she was, while he goes looking for a doctor. The deputy agrees to let him go and directs him to a shortcut to the main road. Paul thanks her for the help, warning her not to touch anything inside the contaminated cabin before walking off. That's when he takes the shortcut through the forest, but quickly realizes that she lied and there is no main road. Stuck in the woods, the man collapses and dies alone, making that four victims down with only one more to go. The next morning, Jeff arrives at the cabin to find all of his friends dead. He walks over to the lake, maniacally laughing to himself that he survived, but then he notices this mark on his hand. It's a sign that he's been infected, and before he can do anything, the deputy shoots him dead, making that five victims down with no more college students left alive. With the friends dead, there's nobody left around to learn an important lesson, never take a vacation, to a cabin in the woods. But what do you think? How would you beat cabin fever? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.